It can be the same chicken pox free zone that we're in now and the same polio free zone we're in now. We could also have an HPV free zone if we're a little bit more aggressive in terms of vaccinating our children. This is something we can do to keep people healthy and to help them prevent the consequences of HPV infection. They, those consequences range from cancer, cervical cancer in women, anal cancer in men, um, genital warts in women, um, women who've had genital warts from transmitting HPV to their newborn and, and causing um, respiratory papillomatosis. So it, it prevents de disease on all fronts. And for me, you know, there are other vaccines that the child is due for usually that day. Um, usually it's the 11 to 12 year old visit that HPV is given. And so they're also due for their tetanus shot. They may, it's a new tetanus shot that's available now, the meningococcal vaccine. Um, they, if it's in the late fall, they may be due for influenza vaccine. So really telling parents all the things that their child is due for that day is really the right way to go. Um, and then you can go through the risk and benefits of each, but because all of them are really relatively relatively safe for most children, there's no real reason to necessarily separate out the HPV vaccine in any real kind of way. You know, the 11 year old time is tricky. You know, I'm there myself as a parent. Uh, you're worried about what's gonna come. And I think to some degree, uh, one hopes that their child will never need the HPV vaccine, that they will never come in contact with the HPV vaccine. But the reality is that, uh, and they're worried about giving them the sex talk and some other kinds of things that I think they feel go along goes along with that vaccine. I think people have to really uncouple their concerns about adolescence and their, um, their need to vaccinate their child from a public health perspective. So to prepare their child for the things that they might encounter um, as a later adolescent and young adult. Uh, and so I talk to them about what, what their issues are, what their concerns are, what their fears are, and I think we have to start there. I think for me, I, I liken the HPV vaccine and its components are often are very similar to the hepatitis B vaccines. And the reality is we give those vaccines on day two of life before we send children home uh, from the hospital, newborns. And no one looks at their newborn and says, oh my goodness, this person's gonna have sex with somebody who does IV drugs or who has um, got H hepatitis B infection, they're thinking, I'm going to do all I can to protect my baby in the future. And I think when we look at our adolescents, we have to remember that little baby and we have to say, I have to do all I can to protect my adolescent for the things they might encounter in the future. And it's really that same perspective that they have to carry through into the, the young adulthood. I think that we see people who say, oh, my son is not sexually active, he doesn't need this now, he doesn't have a cervix, he's not gonna get, he's not gonna get cancer. Because of the way the vaccine was first rolled out, I think people think of this as a vaccine just for women to prevent cervical cancer. But the reality is that there are other things that HPV causes. Not only does it cause um, genital warts, which people can have significant quality of life problems with, uh, particularly if they grow large, um, it can be debilitating even for some people, depending on how they um, look and they have to be treated. Uh, the other issue is that they can cause, in younger children, they can cause respiratory, respiratory papillomatosis and some other kinds of things. Um, and so I think it's really important for men to consider the other things that it can cause as well. I think it's really uncoupling the concerns they have about sex, sexually transmitted infections, and risk that is really something that's like the elephant in the room. And I think oftentimes the vaccine winds up carrying that elephant um, during the adolescent years. And uh, I think it's too heavy. I don't think the vaccine deserves to sort of carry that. I think that's a separate issue that we certainly in the field of pediatrics, we have to take some ownership over in helping parents through this hurdle, just like we helped them through the infant years and the toddler years and the school age years. This emerging adolescent, this tween time is a really an important time to make sure we give young people messages that they can actually use. And, um, and vaccines is just one part Part of anticipatory guidance and routine health care.
I grew up in an era where vaccines um, were something really sort of important for families. They felt privileged to have them. Families risk having one child um, acquire, of every million, acquire, the polio, uh, acquire polio from the oral polio vaccine um, because we didn't want children walking around in braces. And we don't see children having chicken pox anymore, and we don't see children having polio and walking around in braces anymore. And so we're really not thinking about the public health achievement that vaccines offer to children and to families. And so when a new vaccine comes on the market um, or into our, that we can have access to, I think people are really suspicious of it. But the reality is vaccines are probably one of the, the gifts that we can give to our children and one that I encourage parents to really seriously consider when they're in the office. I do think as pediatricians, uh, we have to stay on our job. Um, tweens and teens have different needs. Young adults still need us too. And I think that we can't shy away from things that make us uncomfortable. If they do make us uncomfortable, then we need to practice and get better at doing our jobs so that we can help them um, successfully get into young adulthood.